Hey, thank you for joining me. Hope you're doing well. Magic is the power of influencing the course of events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. The word supernatural is an adjective meaning attributed to some force beyond scientific understanding or relating to an order of existence beyond the visible observable universe. Scientism has become the dominant worldview in this matrix, one that says only scientific claims are meaningful. The word science comes from the Latin sciens, meaning intelligent, skilled. Siens ultimately comes from the word sindir, which is a verb that means to tear or to cut, to divide. So science, the basis of scientism, is really an effort to divide us, to cut off our connection with right-brained principles. The left brain and right brain express different principles. The left brain is responsible for what science upholds, analytical thinking, order, and fragmentation. The right brain is responsible for creativity, compassion, and intuition. Scientism goes against the right-brained feminine principles by advocating an overuse of left-brained ones, and therefore it attempts to divide us. There is much beyond scientific understanding, and much beyond the visible, observable universe. When we stop observing the world only with our left brains and incorporate our right, we discover that these supernatural forces in the definition of magic are simply natural forces. Nothing is purely physical. Everything has a vibration and a consequence. Every thought we think, action we perform, and word we speak directly affects the outcome of our reality and the collectives. So whether we choose to acknowledge it or not, we are all magicians. Magic is really the power of influencing reality. There are magical practices that involve the use of various elements, incense, oils, salt, but the basis of all of them is our inherent creative abilities and our use of thoughts, feelings, and words to manifest. White magic is benevolent, using our intent and powers of manifestation for healing purposes. Black magic is malevolent, using our intent and powers of manifestation for selfish or malicious purposes. The elite who run this world are generational dark occultists who constantly evoke entities and use curses, performing black magic in our everyday lives to further lead us into spiritual chaos. The civilization we're in has been shaped by the elite's black magic workings, which are vampiric in nature. And because we've agreed to many of their operations, most of us are consistently engaging in what I call everyday black magic rituals. One everyday black magic ritual is the consumption of animal flesh and fluids. What's going on right now is an ongoing animal holocaust. When we cage up animals in factories, we deny them an outlet to express their emotions and fulfill their destinies. They can't run around, relate to each other freely, and explore the world as they would like to. They can't do much of anything. Animals raised in slaughterhouses spend their lives in crippling anxiety, depression, and fear. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, and these energies stay within the flesh even after the animal is killed. So when we consume meat, we're absorbing these negative energies, their fear, their grief, and their confusion. The same goes for milk products. Even though the animal was not killed in the process, they still feel pain and sadness from being caged up and having their children kidnapped, a standard practice in animal agriculture. Our earth and sun powers all life on this plane. They infuse everything with life force, what some call prana. All life is tied to the ground in some way. Carnivores can only receive and digest this prana through consuming other animals, but those animals received their life force from the ground. We, however, are not carnivores. This is why we are not naturally attracted to raw meat, and this is why when we eat products with animal cholesterol, our risk for atherosclerosis goes up. Atherosclerosis only affects herbivores, and we don't even fit the definition of an omnivore. Humans are totally incapable of killing, tearing, and consuming raw prey with their natural biological equipment, as all natural omnivores do. Outside of a slaughterhouse, you can just hear the distressing cries being released. Again, meat-eating instills these negative energies within us, contributing to much of humanity's feuds and division. Not to mention, most conventional meat is physically poisoned with growth hormones, vaccinations, and GMO livestock feed. A person with a meat-heavy diet 
tends to have blocked energies within their body since it becomes a storehouse for these energetic poisons. This is why many religions and spiritual schools throughout the ages have taught vegetarianism and veganism. Jainism is based on the principle of nonviolence called ahimsa. Vegetarianism is considered mandatory for all of its practitioners. Jains prefer food that inflict the least amount of violence. It's also an integral part of many schools of Hinduism, with 34% of Hindus eating a strict vegetarian diet. Many Buddhists also observe vegetarianism, as instructed by the first precept. The first precept prohibits Buddhists from killing in general, and this includes people and animals. The Brahmanet Sutra, a text of Mahayana Buddhism, also prohibits eating meat. A disciple of the Buddha must not deliberately eat meat. He should not eat the flesh of any sentient being. The meat eater forfeits the seed of great compassion, severs the seed of the Buddha nature. Many followers of Sikhism follow and promote a vegetarian diet. Seventh-day Adventists strictly practice vegetarianism and many practice veganism. One of the main precepts in Zoroastrianism is respect and kindness toward all living things. In the sayings of Adarbad Maraspandan, the scripture states, abstain rigorously from eating the flesh of kind and all beneficent animals. It's no coincidence there has been so much alignment with spiritual growth and abstaining from flesh eating. Every time you buy a piece of meat from the supermarket, you're agreeing to the ritualistic enslavement and suffering of sentient beings. You are a sentient being. And the same way we agree to the imprisonment of animals when we purchase animal products, we also agree to the imprisonment of ourselves. Authority, which I'll expand on later in this video, is an illusion. Posing as having authority over another sentient being will always result in discord and suffering. When suffering is being done on a ritualistic scale, it's felt in the collective. While we can't eliminate suffering, we can reduce it as much as we can, starting with releasing our unjust authority over our animal brethren. Even farm-raised, grass-fed, and free-range animal products, while energetically better, still contain this control-based consciousness. So when we look into a restaurant or at a nice dinner patio, many of us are unknowingly witnessing a black magic ritual that started with suffering and ends with that energy being transferred to the consumer, changing his or her natural energy by muddying it with fear, aggression, and confusion. Another widespread black magic ritual is the consumption of alcohol. The word alcohol comes from the Arabic al-kul. In Middle Eastern folklore, the al-kul is the name of a ravenous body-eating spirit. And we call strong alcohol spirits. Just like many flesh-eating outlets, we are surrounded by bars, restaurants, liquor stores, clubs, and entertainment venues that sell and promote the use of alcohol. When we drink alcohol, we are more likely to lose control over our emotions, concentration, intellect, and physicality. In short, our defenses come down and we become more energetically open. Negative energies can and often do take advantage of this loss of control and infiltrate our consciousness. Many of these entities are earthbound spirits that try to experience the effects of alcohol through openings in another's energy field. Over time, drinking alcohol can cause tears or a thinning of the aura. The mind becomes dulled and the slow deterioration sets in. When you walk into a bar or party with new eyes, you can see these are not simply humans having a physical experience of intoxication, but humans who are opening up their consciousness for negative energies to pour in. After all, they are drinking spirits. And for those who drink to the point of becoming alcoholics, it's easy to see how their lives begin to unravel. The connection with their spirits is being dulled by spirits. I want to make it clear that it's not the mere altering of consciousness which creates these negative effects and openings. Cannabis, psilocybin mushrooms, LSA, ayahuasca, and other natural substances, when used in moderation and with the intention of spiritual expansion, are incredible, valuable tools. Alcohol, however, does not have that same growth energy. And we can just observe. Those who are drinking become progressively depressed, aggressive, critical, and set in their beliefs. Alcohol is very seducing, like many black magic hexes are, but it can be summed up in the couplet, alcohol gave me wings to fly, and then it took away the sky. 
Another everyday black magic ritual we're all involved in is our addiction to accusation and conflict. The news networks and other forms of media constantly use subtle and not so subtle divide and conquer strategies to keep us fighting, enraged, and feeling helpless. They do this by manipulating us into being against something, whether it's a group of people, an ideology, or even ourselves. When we are against something, when our thoughts and actions are going against an idea, a person, a topic, anything, we are willingly surrendering our energy. Drama and gossip is marketed all around us, and this appeals to the elite's vampiric nature. These manipulations can be subtle. We are surrounded by them our entire lives. So while you may not get enjoyment out of reading a tabloid, you may enjoy criticizing music, going against an ideology you disagree with, or complaining about your current job. Just go into any public venue and listen to the conversations being had. Most of them are riddled with insignificant feuds, gossip, worries, a whole host of topics that take our divine creative powers and redirect them into conflict and division. This casting of our energy means we're imposing black magic all around us. Again, black magic is using our intent and powers of manifestation for selfish or malicious purposes. Going against something is using these powers for malicious purposes because it propagates discord. Much of our division is reflective of our efforts to control others. Control is the same consciousness the elite aim to inflict on all of us. This new heart-centered paradigm is not going to be built by the same mechanisms of control that this matrix is built on. We must let things flow. We must lead by example and stand for things, not standing against them. This doesn't mean disagreement is wrong. You can disagree with something, like I disagree with the ritual abuse of animals, but once it's taking energy from you, disagreement becomes toxic opposition. In my video on sacred sexuality, I explore how our vital sexual energy is being manipulated. Images of inverted sexuality is propped up all around us in the form of advertisements and entertainment streams. The goal is to implant inverted ideas of sexuality in the collective, so our vital energy is used for harm. This, by definition, is black magic. What else is heavily promoted? Toxic food. The foods marketed to us are of course full of toxic animal products with fear-based frequencies, but also chemical additives, over-processed ingredients, and unnatural forms of sugar and salt. The body and mind are directly connected, Consuming these heavily commercialized foods is violating the body as much as it is the mind. If it's being pushed on us, it's for spiritual defilement. But to the untrained eye, it goes unnoticed. Much of this defilement is simply a part of what we call modern civilization. Each element sizzles before being expounded upon. In other words, this manipulation of our own energy and reality is pushed on us incrementally. What we see in the media and all around us is the result of carefully planned debasement of the human spirit, slowly giving us physical and spiritual poison. The elite know that we are naturally empathetic beings, so they try to use this empathy against us by turning it into contempt under the guise of unity and societal progression. This is reflected in feminism, Black Lives Matter, many of the social justice causes, and the controlled parts of the truther movement. At face value, these movements seem admirable, but are full of control-based energy. We are given staged mass shootings and pre-planned events that pull at our heartstrings. The elite want us to feel helpless, staring at these staged events, and letting it disturb us so much that we further give in to fear, and therefore ask for our own further enslavement. Another everyday black magic ritual is the use of oil. Earth is quite literally a living, breathing organism. We can call her Mother Earth, the Earth Goddess, the Great Mother. There's many names that have been attributed to her throughout the ages, like the Greek Gaia and the Egyptian Isis. She is the center of this creation. We're told that oil is created when the fossils of dinosaurs and similar ancient buried organisms are heated up under pressure for millions of years. It's a fossil fuel. But oil is normally drilled at 30,000 feet, whereas the deepest fossils are normally not found below 16,000 feet. Oil is not a fossil fuel. In fact, the term has always been false. 
This myth started in 1892 when John D. Rockefeller used his paid scientists at the Geneva Convention to declare that because oil is composed of hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon, that it must be residue from living matter, and therefore, ancient fossils. The abiotic oil formation theory strongly suggests that crude oil is the result of naturally occurring processes within the Earth. For decades, there have been many studies on the abiotic origin of oil, although most have gone unnoticed. No one has yet synthesized crude oil in a lab from dead plant matter, because it's not from plant matter. The Koji Indians hold that oil is Mother Earth's blood, and this is no analogy. The truth is that crude oil is the blood of the Earth flowing deep within her veins. Crude oil actually does resemble blood. It hardens upon exposure to air, just like how human blood scabs upon exposure. Both oil and blood have thick, sticky consistencies that have a gelatinous quality. Within oil, there is naturally occurring bacteria. In the same vein, pun intended, our blood is full of microscopic, naturally occurring pleomorphic bacteria. A gallon of crude oil weighs anywhere from 7 to 8 pounds. A gallon of human blood, depending on the person, can weigh anywhere from 6.8 to 8.2 pounds. Mother Earth still has abundant reservoirs of her blood, her oil, constantly regenerating it just like the human body regenerates blood when it's donated or lost. But if we suck her too dry, she can't regenerate fast enough. The extraction and use of oil is literal vampirism, feeding off of Mother Earth's blood for use in our technologies. So since the dawn of cars, we've had alternatives to crude oil. Oil interests are huge, but it's not simply money that propagates the industry. Behind the scenes lies a parasitic philosophy of intentionally extracting Mother Earth's blood. This is why the whole of modern society is completely dependent on oil and the materials produced from it. Along with pollution, the cutting down of trees, and other environmental woes, it's all a war on Mother Earth, representative of the war on the Divine Feminine the right-brained principles that have been covered up with fear, control, and scientism. The same way oil is the blood of the earth, trees are like her lungs, filtering and cleaning the air. We are like the microbes on Mother Earth. When we maintain healthy bodies, our energy goes to the many microorganisms and bacteria throughout. It's a positive symbiotic relationship. The bacteria in our body naturally provides protection against infection. But when we have a weakened immune system, this relationship weakens, and the bacteria cannot assist in doing their proper jobs. Likewise, we are the caretakers of Earth. When we take care of Earth properly, it's a loving relationship that benefits both. But when we are weakened, we as microbes become parasitic. Look at a baby. A room can be full of adults, but once a baby enters, we notice a shift. All of a sudden, many of us want to make the baby laugh. We are awestruck by its beauty and untouched nature. Along with our natural protective instincts, we are also identifying with the baby's innocence. The baby reflects that which has been lost in much of humanity. Babies automatically reject the cold, masqueraded nature of the system. They deeply feel energy and are still intact with their clairvoyance and telepathy. But indoctrination, which aims to shut off the feminine, right-brained principles, begins early on, shielding our children from the world and instead manufacturing the version of them that society wants. Well before they're adults, most have been imprinted with the ideas that the world is a manipulative, selfish place, instilling a scarcity-based consciousness which is based on the foundation of fear. The innocence that was once seen in the baby has now been hidden. The emphasis in education is to think solely with our brains. But what about our hearts? The heart actually functions as a type of second brain. When we feel through our hearts, we become more in tune with ourselves and our true intelligence. We've all heard the phrases, think with your heart and follow your heart. When we say, get to the heart of the matter, we mean get to the essence. The heart allows us to feel what is best at an internal level, connecting us to our intuition. The word heart is an anagram for the word earth. This is no coincidence. When we truly connect with our hearts, then we will ultimately connect with earth. Home is where the heart is. The heart is not simply a mechanical organ. 
it generates the strongest electromagnetic field out of any organ in the body. Our soul resides in our heart. This is what this electromagnetic field is, the electrical outpour of our soul. This is why it's the first organ to develop and function in a fetus. The spiritual teacher Srila Prabhupada sums this up perfectly. The individual atomic soul is definitely there in the heart along with the super soul, and thus all the energies of bodily movement are emanating from this part of the body. The black magic rituals of consuming animal products and drinking alcohol over time damage the heart. This is proof that these practices dull the connection and processing of information between these avatars and our higher selves. Let's get back to babies. Babies have unaltered, decalcified pineal glands. Ancient esoteric schools have long known this area in the center of the brain to be a type of stargate, a pathway between the physical and non-physical planes. It's also been known as the mind's eye, or third eye. Toxic food, poor nutrition, weak immunity, and fluoride are to blame for the rampant calcification of the pineal gland worldwide. A blocked pineal gland is associated with many disorders, mentally, physically, and spiritually. When our pineal gland is calcified, it's harder to receive direct contact from other planes of existence, and therefore any spiritual guidance we could be receiving from these planes is severely dampened. Here's three quick tips to decalcify your pineal gland. It's really not that hard. Eat a healthy, balanced diet, preferably free of animal products. Eliminate all forms of fluoride, including conventional water and toothpaste. And most importantly, get in the sun. Sunlight activates the pineal gland and is the best way to stimulate decalcification. Sun gazing can do this quicker than any other method, although I recommend you do it correctly, beginning when the sun is low in the sky, starting 10 seconds on the first day, adding on 10 seconds each day, moving upwards to 44 minutes, and then switching to 10 minutes three times per week. The shutting off of our pineal glands, as well as the concealment of processes how to awaken them, is blatant black magic. The biggest part of this everyday black magic is the redirecting of our attention toward illusions. Materialism is one of these illusions, and it's ingrained in the fabric of this false matrix. The definition is a tendency to consider material possessions and physical comfort as more important than spiritual values. There's a reason we're told to constantly buy, that buying these things will make us have better lives. The search for material comfort draws us away from the search for spiritual comfort. No matter what products we cover our bodies with, decorate our homes with, or buy for enhanced convenience, none of these will ultimately gratify us. If we want freedom from boredom, pain, misery, worries, anxieties, then the only solution is to change ourselves, change our outlook and values. Spirituality seeks happiness within. Materialism seeks happiness without. These things have become idols, items of worship, but we should be worshiping our own divine essence and each other's. The elite attempt to divide us with materialism by giving us the fallacy of ownership, therefore promoting the illusion of separation. My car, my house, my purse, my stuff. And materialism, by its very nature, gives way to vanity, pride, and greed. This is not you. This also isn't you. Neither is this, neither is this, neither is this, neither is this. <laughs> These are illusory archetypes that have been given to you. There's many fun aspects to these archetypes, but ultimately, you did not come up with them. They've been predetermined, handed over to you as subtle methods of control. We masochistically seek gratification and approval from these sets of fantasies and identities. Many of us hide behind them in our day-to-day -day lives, and since our focus is a vehicle for creation, we become attached to the vibrations of these archetypes. The reason we can never truly be these archetypes is because, again, they're illusory. These identities are unobtainable, they do not truly exist, and therefore leave us deprived of our true nature, which is divine and not covered up by false identities. I'm not telling you to not identify with a group because that's natural, but be aware of how it's affecting you. One of the biggest elements of everyday black magic is the imposition of the dog-eat-dog -dog mentality. 
Dog eat dog is an adjective meaning marked by destructive or ruthless competition without self-restraint and ethics. Dog eat dog describes a world in which people fight for themselves. It promotes the idea of scarcity, again, reflective of an overemphasis on left-brained masculine principles. The common assertion in this worldview is that there's a certain amount of resources, love, and enjoyment in the world, and that one must constantly stake their individual claim, or else be subject to the greed of another human. Most people would agree with the statement, humans are naturally greedy. But this is a lie that's been given to us through this dog-eat-dog -dog mentality. This state of mind has been cultivated through means of the elite and their black magic all around us. It's not who we really are. What's going on in the world is not reflective of our true nature, but a reflection of what happens when our true nature is actively suppressed, hidden, and used against us. This dog-eat-dog -dog mentality is ultimately based on the illusion of money. Money carries no inherent energy. Mother Earth carries energy in the form of air, water, etc. Our bodies and spirits create energy. The sun, the stars, the planets, these all create energy. But money is backed only by our own willful slavery and stupidity. Money is a voluntary illusion. It's what's at the core of materialism and the illusion of separation. The very idea of a medium of exchange is also illusory. If we are to end separation and work together as one people, we need to move towards a gift-based society where nothing is expected and all exchange is done out of altruism and empathy. The use of money is not mandatory. It's only the belief in it that upholds this idea. There are systems we haven't even thought about yet that could yield abundant shelter, food, and clean water for everyone, working with the earth instead of against it. Wouldn't that be a system where nobody has anything? This response is still operating under a scarcity-based dog-eat-dog mentality. A gift-based society would operate without any need for regulation or control, and therefore it would automatically give way to abundance. Humans are the only organisms in this reality that are required to pay for their right to exist. This concept has led to mass psychosis. We work our entire lives for this thing that the elite tells us we need to survive. While working for this worthless paper, we help them build this energy extraction matrix. So the true people making this reality a dystopia and upholding these illusions are us. We are the slaves who build their empire. Another illusion is authority. This illusion is propagated by the idea of the legitimacy of government. Govern comes from the Latin verb gubernare, meaning to direct, rule, guide. Ment comes from the Latin mente, meaning mind, which comes from the Indo-European mentis, meaning thought. The word government literally means mind control or the rule of thought. One cannot delegate a right that they do not inherently possess themselves. These so-called rights our government has invented give them permission to impose their own man-made laws, laws which are out of sync with this multiverse's natural laws. The law of attraction, the law of cause and effect, the law of correspondence. All of these universal laws do not require any form of man-made dominance or sovereignty. They're naturally active, in constant perpetual motion, and therefore are divine and true, complete laws that exist out of man's ability to control them. These man-made laws lend to the illusion of penalty. The idea is, because a law is made, it therefore must be followed. If it is not followed, the order followers of the government are allowed genuine authority to reprimand and penalize. Again, one cannot delegate a right that they do not naturally possess themselves. And this is why government and any position of authority will always be completely false. Accepting the illusion of authority coincides with accepting the duty to obey a master, meaning accepting one's own enslavement. One cannot believe in authority, man-made laws and penalties, or government, and truly be free. Government only has power over us because we allow it to. We've bought into their illusion of authority, and therefore we can denounce this black magic illusion just as easily as we bought into it. But we don't have to protest. Protesting, as I've said before, is a form of begging. 
begging our slave masters to change conditions, still buying into the illusion that they have the power. We also don't have to replace government with a new, more updated control system. This will always lead to the same restrictive outcome. Many will ask, but if there's no government, who will protect us? Again, this lends to the dog-eat-dog -dog mentality, assuming humans are naturally greedy and even dangerous when left to their own devices. The true reason we see widespread crime, murder, rape, and overall dysfunction is because we've been marketed illusions. These illusions, when embraced, will always lead to imbalances, toxic worldviews, and destructive behavior. If we are to grow a new system based in compassion, unity, and truth, then we must completely abolish all forms of man-made illusions. When this happens, we will all be using our divine creative essence, our white magic, to power a new paradigm. The elite have tried to tell us that God is a masculine being. On this plane, Mother Earth is the feminine God S, who is truly deserving of our worship. They've also tried telling us that the Creator is separate from us, and that we are like undeserving minions who must worship and gain His external approval so that we may finally be considered complete and righteous. There's a reason why the monotheistic religions have been such a mechanism of control. When we believe that the only higher power lies outside of ourselves, we are further surrendering our energy and creative abilities. Collectively, we make up God. We are the Creator, which is why when we are divided into individual isolated portions of consciousness, we are actually creating our collective reality. We are points of expression and consciousness in the mind of the Creator. We all originated from one source, and will therefore, at some point, all come back to the same source. This is where we get the saying, we are all one. This is the truth. It's just hard to see when we are in these individual bodies. This is why there's no need to get worked up about the elite's black magic rituals and fear-based programming. Each of us waking up and realizing our divine potential and using that creative ability in our everyday lives to spread love and truth ultimately does change things. While many of us, including myself, are still engaged in some forms of these illusions and black magic rituals, embracing love over time will tear down this structure and effortlessly replace it with a heart-based consciousness. How I see it is right now we're in the age of truth. Truth leads to information, information leads to motivation, and motivation leads to action. We cannot fight fire with fire. We must break free and let the fire burn where they're standing eventually turning into an ash that we can spread and from it grow new life. Darkness is a great teacher, and that's why the more they throw at us, the more chances for mass awakening we have. We can transmute everything around us. We can hold up our water, our food, speak towards the sun, towards any element, and profess, I intend to bring forth heaven on earth, allowing these vibrations to pervade all throughout our lives, transmuting ourselves and the world in the process. So once again, thank you for watching. Stay well and centered. I love you all.